Hi everybody, I'm Lawrence Moroni. I'm reporting here from the TensorFlow Summit. We're in the TensorFlow Cafe, and it's a great pleasure to be chatting with Ian Langmore, who's a software engineer, and he works with TensorFlow in nuclear physics. Ian, welcome. Hey, well, thanks for having me on. So tell us all about it. What, what do you do? There's a goal of powering, uh, of getting power from nuclear fusion, right? So it's incredibly energy dense. Right. What you do is you take, uh, maybe I can borrow a couple of these uh, coffee grinds. You put together two small nuclei. Okay. And what you get out weighs a little bit less than what you put in. And the remainder is a huge amount of energy. Right. So it's the conversion of mass to energy. And, and E equals mc squared, right? Exactly, yeah. And so it's so incredibly energy dense that to provide the power that humanity would need over the next hundred years would require, say, the boron that the world currently produces for just seven months. So say, hey, set aside the next seven months of boron and we have enough energy for the next hundred years and wow. no greenhouse gas emissions. That would be nice. That would be nice. And it's also challenging. So obviously anything that has that high of a payoff, people have been trying, and they've been trying for about 70 years. And what happens is the plasma gets unstable. So, so the reaction happens inside of this plasma, which is say a swarm of charged particles at 10 million degrees or hotter, and they don't want to stay in place. Right, so they, and, and they get excited at that temperature. Yeah, <laughs> things get a little hot, they want to get out. Yeah. And what happens is things become unstable, they, they, they get out and then it cools down and the reaction stops. And we end up putting in more energy just to keep the reaction going than we get out. And that's what's been happening for 70 years. Wow, okay. So there's this company in um, Foothill Ranch uh, TAA Technologies that is now on their fifth generation plasma generator. Okay. We've been working with them since 2015 to try to accelerate progress. So it's, this ends up being this gigantic machine. It's like, think of this long cigar where there's a hot plasma in the middle. Okay. And the goal is to use magnets and neutral beams and all these other technologies to keep that plasma confined. So this is an experimental reactor. It's, I mean, it's, it's not the fusion reaction is not what's happening. What you're ha what's happening here is you're seeing how can, tightly can we confine this plasma as we ramp up the temperature. And so they're doing experiments every 20 minutes and then every 20 minutes they push down data, we pull it in and we give back a three-dimensional image of what their plasma looks like. Okay, nice. You might think, well, why can't I just look at the plasma? <laughs> you know, and the point is, first of all, it's, uh, well, it's, it's very thin and it's incredibly hot. And, I, you, you know, you could consider, like, why can't I just look at a light bulb and tell you what's inside of it? Well, you only have a two-dimensional view. You're on the boundary. You get a two-dimensional view of what goes on, but you want to look at a three-dimensional object. Right. And moreover, it's so hot that you can only have a limited number of views into it. So what you end up with things are like you shine 14 lasers through the center and you measure the phase shift of those lasers. Okay. And this gives you the density along each of the lines. But from that, you want to reconstruct the density everywhere. So it's a very underdetermined problem. So I've gone on for a little no, bit No, this here. is great. So I'm, it's helping clarify it for me, hopefully for you too. Uh, so, but the idea then is that, so this, uh, this fusion reactor, every 20 minutes you're doing an experiment, you're pulling that into code that you've written in TensorFlow, and then that code is generating this 3D image, right? Yeah. Now, that's not the typical use of TensorFlow. No, no, not at all. So this really isn't deep learning, this is an inverse problem. This is great though, so it just shows the flexibility of the platform. Yeah, a real key difference is in deep learning, often you have many, many, many examples. You have many, many labels, so you have the input-output, and you can learn a very complex functional relationship. So here we actually don't have the labels. The, the labels would be, this is what the actual plasma looks like, but we're the ones telling people what the plasma looks like. We don't have those. We do have a precise model for how the measurement works. And so from that, it, it's, and you can away think the naive thing would be just to invert the equation. So if this is what the plasma was, this is what the measurement is. Well, if we know the measurement, let's invert the equation and get the plasma. Problem is, it's, there's many plasmas that could have given the same measurement. So we're going to give them a distribution over possible plasmas. So I we're see. doing a Bayesian inverse problem. Okay. 
and our graph is modeling the measurement physics and some physical assumptions rather than an arbitrary function. So then the output of this, does it become a situation where, because they're running an experiment every 20 minutes, that they can now optimize their future experiments based on the results that you're giving them? Yeah, well, they can understand their experiments based on these results. There's actually a, a coincident effort by Googlers to help optimize experimental design, and there was a paper published in that. Ted Baltz is, was one of the names, uh, Michael Dukoski. We'll, we'll, we'll put a link to the paper yeah. in the description so then people can go read it for themselves. So fascinating stuff and it's like how did you get involved in this well so i had been at google for about four years and i was looking around internally for teams that were doing something with reducing greenhouse gas emissions and so then this popped up and i was like oh this is great and then it's an inverse problem which is what i did for my phd and my postdoc so i was like okay this is like a perfect fit so then i started working with them Nice. Is your role like coding the uh, way you're yeah, generating Yeah, so uh, my role is writing the code and also coming up with the statistical models. So I've been writing code specific for our team, and then also at the same time I've been writing code for the TensorFlow distributions and TensorFlow probability libraries. So these are sort of form the core building blocks, like we have a, a normal distribution object or a Laplace distribution and so on and so forth. And these are... Uh, you know, it's, it's an object that allows you to, you can produce samples, you can get a PDF and so on. And then we have a method of transforming one distribution to another with this thing called the bijector. Yep, yep. So we, uh, we actually did an episode of Coffee with a Googler We're on the distribution API. Oh, awesome. Which is like, yeah, so check it out on uh, the Google Developers channel. It was, it was, to me, it was mind bending because of just the kind of things that it offers to you as an API, bijectors and all that kind of thing. So it's like, as a developer, you can go check that out, the distributions API, and maybe they'll be able to build something like you built for the nuclear fusion. So. Um, thank you so much, Ian. This has been a blast. And it's like, All right. uh, I, I, I never expected to come here to learn a little bit about nuclear fusion today. So it's like a very pleasant surprise. So thank you so much. If you have any questions for me or if you have any questions for Ian, just please leave them in the comments below. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.